What's going on, engineers? It's time to get a handle on how Linux processes work. In this video, we're going to talk about the role of the init system, how fork and exec works for starting new processes, and then some commands for managing processes like ps, kill, fgbg, and jobs. Let's jump in. So first, let's talk about processes. Process is nothing more than a piece of running code on your computer that's executing some task. Every process has a process ID and every process has a parent ID because every process is started by a parent. There is one process, however, that is not started by another process, and that's the init process, which bears process ID number one. So before I tell you how PID one starts, let's look at it in our process table. So we're going to use the PS command. It's going to be PS F, and we're going to provide number one, which is process ID one. And that will give us the information here. You can see that the PPID, which is parent, process ID is zero, and the process ID is one. So the init system on my machine is going to be system D. Now there's a number of init systems such as upstart or sysv init or openrc, but the most popular in 2018 is going to be system D for right now. But if parent process ID is zero, then what actually started this? Well, the truth is the Linux kernel started it. Basically, the system is broken up into two pieces. One piece is something we call kernel space, and then another piece is something that we call user space. So basically what happens is when you boot your machine, it calls the Linux kernel. And the Linux kernel does a lot of different things, but once it finishes everything it does in kernel space, the only thing it does in user space is calls one process. And in this case, it's going to be systemd, and then whatever that comes after it. Once systemd gets called, or sysv init, or openrc, upstart, or whatever init system you're using, that init system is now responsible for starting all the other processes that the computer needs to run in user space. So let's run a simple command now and analyze exactly what's happening. So I'll run a simple command like ls, dash l, which gives me a list of files. So remember I said that parent processes start child processes. So when I ran ls dash l, what happened was the current process, which is a bash shell, it forked into two, and then the copy of itself was replaced by ls. So now what you have running is bash, my original shell, and then a child process called ls, which runs. And this is what we call fork and exec. It first forks, which makes a copy, and the exec replaces that process with another process. Now there's another way to demonstrate the function of exec. So remember I said exec replaces the current process. So when I do ls-l, I get a list. If I had files, I would get a list of files. If I do exec ls-l, remember, the current process bash will be replaced with ls, and then when it exits, terminal just disappears. This happens because in the first case, bash executes ls, and then once ls is done, it goes back to bash. But if you use exec, it replaces bash with ls, and then it just disappears. When I do ls-l, the same thing is still happening. It's still running exec. It's just running exec on the forked process. So that's why this terminal does not exit. So now let's move on to managing processes. The first command we're going to use is ps, which is going to show you a lot of different information about processes. And ps is a very complicated command. So first, if we run ps with no arguments, we get the current processes in the shell. If we run psf, it's the same kind of info, but you get this little line and that shows you kind of the hierarchy of the commands. Additionally, you also get the status of the commands. So next I'm going to start a long running command and we're going to manipulate it in a couple different ways. So a good command for that is going to be the sleep command because when you run sleep, like sleep one, it sleeps for one second and then ends. So this will be good to keep a, keep a command running for a long time. So I'm going to start by doing sleep 360 and you can see that it just freezes. Now what happened here is when I ran sleep, it made a copy of the process, it forked, and then it ran exec on that fork process, and now I have bash, and then the child process is sleep. And then sleep, because it was executed by bash, inherits standard in, standard out, and standard error. Now you see now that I can't run any commands in the terminal, and that's because it's not owned by bash anymore. You know, so I, I can't do ls-l here. I mean, I can write it and hit enter, but I'm sending that to sleep. I'm not actually executing it, you know, in a way where it'll show up. So if I want to regain control of the terminal, I have to do one of two things. I either have to kill the process, or I have to suspend the process and then do something with it. So to, to just turn off the process, you just do control C and that will send it a sig int signal, which will, which will terminate it. 
But if that were a process I wanted to keep running, that would not be ideal. So let's start it over. We'll do sleep 360 again. Except this time I'm going to suspend the process. And to suspend a process, you simply do Control Z. So I have my terminal back now, and I have one process running. I can see a list of jobs I have running by using the jobs command. So job number one, it stopped, and it's the command sleep 360. I can also look at my process table by doing PSF. You can see now that bash has two child processes. It has the sleep 360 command, and then it has just the PSF that I just ran. So if I want to start that sleep process back up, I could do one of two things. If I wanted to start back in the foreground, I can just do FG. And because it's only one process in my jobs table, I, it will just pick that one. And you can see it tells you the command, and then it just starts running again. But again, I can't use my terminal here. So if I want to start it in the background, I can suspend it again. And in this case, I'll do BG. And this only works because there's only one process in the jobs table. We're going to do an example in a second where there's multiple. So now I have access to my terminal, and sleep is running in the background. And we can verify it's running by doing PSF. You can see now that what was a T is now an S. T means it's in a stop state, and S means it's in an interruptible sleep state. So let's clear this out and look at our jobs table. So we still have one running job. So you'll note that when I started Sleep360, I put it into the foreground, I suspended it, and then I put it into the background. You could start jobs directly into the background by using the ampersand. So if I want to start, say, sleep 700 ampersand, sleep 701 ampersand, sleep 702 ampersand. So I started three processes. They're all sleep processes, sleeping for 700, 701, 702 seconds. And then it gives me the, the two is going to be the job number. And then that number is going to be the process ID. So you'll see now that the jobs table has a lot more in it. And for those wondering, this little plus and minus, all this means is the plus was the basically the last job I sent to the background, and then the minus was the second to last job I sent to the background. So remember I said the FG command brings a job into the foreground, but now I have four jobs running, so it's not as easy as just hitting FG. So I have to specify now the job number. So if I want to bring forward, say, sleep 701, I can do FG, percentage sign, 3. When I do that, you can see it says sleep 701, and now sleep has been brought back into the foreground. At this point, let's just terminate this process, and then we'll look at the jobs table again. So now I only have two. And the reason I have two is because that sleep 360 has expired since, since I've been recording. So what I'll do is I'll just cancel the remaining jobs. So I'll do foreground percentage two, then I'll terminate that, and then I'll do foreground, which will give me the last one, and I'll terminate that. And then now when I do jobs, you can see that nothing shows up because there are no jobs. So next thing we're going to do now is we're going to start a bunch of sleep jobs up again, but we're going to we're going to use a second terminal to send kill signals to them to make them do different things. So we'll, we'll start a bunch up now. So we'll start 1,000 seconds, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Look at our jobs table. So we have four, four processes running right now, and all the PIDs are over here. So next thing I need to do is get information about these processes. So I can use PS, AX, and then grep, and then sleep. So what this gives me is this gives me all the processes that have sleep in the command. And you can see that these four match the four that were started. So the way the kill command works is you do kill, and then you do the signal, and then you do the PID. So there's a bunch of different signals on the system, and you can get a list of signals by doing kill-l. And that gives you all different signals with the signal number but we're only going to focus on a few of them. The ones we're interested in are 15, which is a sig term, a 2, which is a sig int, 1 is a sig hup, which is sig hangup, and then 9 is a sig kill. If you do kill with no signal, it just assumes you're doing a sig term. So let's just do a basic kill. We'll do a kill-15. So we have a bunch of jobs running here. So what we're going to do is we're going to kill the sleep 1002. So to kill that, we do kill-15, and then specify the process ID, which we'll do 16293. So when I kill that, come back over here and do jobs, and we see that one is now in the terminated state. Now while it's no longer a process, which we can verify by running this again, you can see that the sleep 1002 is gone. It is still in the jobs table because the shell still knows about it. It's just it's not a running process anymore. 
Now, when you send a sig term, a sig int, or a sig hub to a process, normally the process will exit, but it's not obligated to do so. Applications can can listen for a signal and then process it in some way. So, if an application says, "I will I will catch a sig term, a a kill dash 15, and then I'll simply ignore it," the application is free to do so. This is why sig kill exists or kill dash nine. So when you do a kill dash nine and send a process a sig kill, it it is not even aware that it it was it was killed. The the kernel will actually take the process and just remove it from the process table, and the application can do nothing about it. It cannot be stopped. So you may be asking yourself, why not just kill dash nine everything? And the answer to that is, when you kill dash nine, it's it's considered a dirty shutdown of that application. That application, when you would terminate it with like a sig term, it has an opportunity to say, "Oh, I I see the sig term, so I'm going to do some cleanup. I'm going to I'm going to close out file handlers. I'm going to write a, a queue to a file. I'm I'm going to do some stuff before I stop." But when you do a kill dash nine, that's it. It's done right then. And if it was in the middle of writing to a file, maybe your file is now corrupted. However, sig kill does have its purpose. It's a great way to deal with a misbehaving process. Now, I listed these kind of in order of what I call, you know, like killing aggressiveness. So when I want to kill a process, I start with 15, and then I go to two, and then I go to one. And if it still doesn't want to abide by the kill signal, then I give it the nine, and then that's the end of it. It's gone because kill dash nine cannot fail. Which signal you use is completely up to you. It's just know that when you do a kill dash nine. You are not giving the application a chance to shut down, and depending on what that application was doing when you issued that signal, it could lead to some unintended consequences. But it works all the same. So we'll pull back our jobs table. We still got a couple running. We'll get our list here. So we'll do a kill dash nine on sleep one thousand, and all the same. You know the process disappears from there. And in this case, it says killed because it got a, a killed signal. Now, the one last note I want to make about the kill command is that not all signals you send with kill actually kill the process. So, for instance, when you start a process and then you do Control Z, what you're really sending it is a signal 20, a sig t stop. And then from that state, when you run FG or BG to start it back up, you're running a 18 sig continue. So, just to demonstrate this, we'll start a job in the background called You know, we'll do sleep 999 in the background. We get a process ID of 17468. Now we can see that that process is running with the jobs command. But now let's suspend it with kill. So we do kill dash 20. Specify that process ID. And you can see now it says stopped. When I run jobs, it also confirms that it is in fact stopped. And now I'll use kill dash 18 to start it back up. So kill dash 18. Give it that process ID, and then magically it starts back up, which we can confirm with the jobs command, and we see it there. It's now running. So think of the kill command as a signal sender and not necessarily a process killer. I mean, it does both. And that's it for processes. I know we talked about a lot of stuff and we sort of jumped around, you know, quite a bit, but hopefully everybody was able to learn a little bit about processes and killing, and how the init system works, and how everything else is started, and how it's all structured. As always, if you have any questions about this video, leave a comment below or come on Discord, chat with me there. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.